आज के चीफ गेस्ट हमारे प्रोफेसर एम ए कलाम साहब हैं मैं हम्बल रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ एम ए कलाम साहब को कि प्लीज़ आप डायस पे आइए सर और मैं हमारे सिसिप के डायरेक्टर और सोशलॉजी के हेड प्रोफेसर पी एच मोहम्मद साहब को भी रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ कि प्लीज़ डायस पे आइए और अभी हम जो डिस्कस कर रहे हैं मैं आपको बताया हूँ कि साहब आज रिव्यू ऑफ लिटरेचर पे डिस्कस करेंगे आप सब से मेरी गुजारिश है कि आप इसको तोज्जो से सुनिए और जो भी आपको डाउट्स हैं आप लेक्चर के बाद पूछ सकते हैं रिलेटेड टू टॉपिक या नहीं तो आपके पीएचडी में भी कुछ डाउट है वो भी पूछ सकते हैं आप तो मैं हमारे डायरेक्टर साहब को रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ कि फर्दर प्रोग्राम को हमारे डायरेक्टर साहब प्रोसीड करिए आई रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर पी एच मोहम्मद सर डायरेक्टर प्लीज गिव इंट्रोडक्शन प्रोफेसर एम ए कलाम साहब सर असलकुम गुड मॉर्निंग to you all i take this opportunity to introduce and invite a an a great personality an eminent scholar and what not if i start saying all that it, it will be more than one hour so i take this opportunity on behalf of, behalf of the department of sociology and the center for the study of social exclusion inclusive policy uh, who is the main uh, who is organizing this uh, program today in collaboration so i uh, i welcome you all i in, welcome you all to this program of workshop on review of literature for researchers in social sciences friends this is, this has been a long pending uh, activity that we uh, had foreseen because you all know that we the department of sociology and center for study of social exclusion and inclusive policy give much emphasis to research and that to a quality research uh, you know and you have been uh, you have been witnessing that we have invited very good personalities very good researchers very good intellectuals in the department and uh, thus uh, you know making the knowledge transferable to the students and uh, the learners students research scholars and other uh, faculty members in the university and thus the department of sociology is the is in the forefront in organizing such events so this workshop is basically to you know benefit the research scholars and the future research scholars that is pg students and also to refer uh, also to the to the faculty young faculty of course the senior faculty also to refresh their knowledge to attain some techniques and uh, improve their knowledge about the uh, research related activities such as review of literature so friends with this few words and of course this is not the first activity that we are going to have with professor uh, professor kalam sir the and you know that uh, he has uh, uh, he has come yesterday he participated in a uh, ug four years ug program that the university is going to be introduced and the the, the department wa, re, had required to uh, develop our own the uh, four years ug program of sociology so the, we had uh, invited him yesterday also we may, we travel we traveled him and he gave very good inputs enriching our pro, uh, structure of uh, ba program uh, so friends the uh, i will introduce I, i take this opportunity to intro, uh, introduce you to, to to you all this great personality that we are having with us today professor m a kalam uh, is a very distinguished is a distinguished vis visiting fellow at the peninsula foundation and currently a visiting professor center for economic and social studies hyderabad he was dean school of liberal arts social sciences and professor of anthropology srm university amravati andhra pradesh also he was a founding dean administration uh, looking after administrating and re administration and regulatory affairs and professor of anthropology at kriya university which was uh, established uh, which, which is established recently in andhra pradesh uh, it's uh, it's at sri city andhra uh, andhra pradesh prior to that he was 
a professor of eminence at Tejpur Central University, Assam. Uh, he was the professor and head of the department of anthropology and chairperson, of course, dean, School of Social Sciences, University of Madras. Basically, Professor Kalam uh, has, is, uh, has worked in the department of anthropology for, I think, more than three decades in, the, in Madras University, Chennai. And uh, friends, Dr. Kalam was Rockefeller resident fellow at Duke University. Human Rights Fellow at uh, Harvard University and also Commonwealth Academic Fellow, Academic Staff Fellow at the London School of Economics and also uh, Economics and Political Science. He was also visiting professor at universities in France as also at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla. Friends, though uh, he, he, he has a very rich experience Although it takes around, if I read all that, it is, I think, about 50 pages. But still, uh, I think I cannot be confined without saying few more, uh, you know, positions he has held. Uh, Dr. Kalam's doctoral research was among the Kurks, that is Kodawas. Kurk is very famous these days, you know, it's a very tourist place there. Kodawas are the tribes uh, living there. He has worked among the Kodawas in Karnataka. Subsequently, he, was, he has studied the mass religious conversions in Tamil Nadu and uh, internal and overseas migrations, seasonal migrant labor, and religious and linguistic minorities also. Also, friends, he has undertaken, uh, he has undertaken anthropological fieldwork among South Asians in England, the, uh, in England, the USA, and France. He has participated in post-tsunami rehabilitation and reconstruction work in Thailand, Sri Lanka, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Dr. Kalam has been a consultant to minorities, ministries of the Government of India, Danida, NACO, and so on. Currently, he is on the board of Bharat Rural Livelihood Foundation. Dr. Kalam has extensively has an extensive administrative experience also. He was on the board of management of Tejpur University, Assam, and, on the planning, and also on the planning board of Pondicherry Central University. He was governing council member of the Indian Council of Social Sciences Research. He has also served as a member of the expert group on diversity index. You know, diversity index uh, was the, uh, is the commission uh, formed by government of India of, uh, appointed by government of India under Professor Amitabh Kundu. Amitabh Kundu, sir, was here recently. You must have all, uh, had interaction, interacted with him. Professor Kalam was a member, uh, member in that uh, Diversity Index Commission appointed by the government of India in the past. Dr. Kalam continues to publish extensively, not just academically, but also in newspapers, uh, news portals, and portage, uh, periodicals. periodicals uh, to share with you a small thing about Professor, Pub, Professor Kalam's publications and how prolific he is, I just uh, 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 share with you the statement somebody made in this regard that uh, by the time you complete his article, he will pu publish another article. Such a prolific writer, such a prolific publisher, and such a prolific academic personality that we have today, that Dr. Kalam has been a Keen sportsman also, apart from academic caliber, academic uh, acumenship, Dr. Kalam is a sportsman also. He, he has represented his college, university, and state in football. You can see him. You can see him. You can feel it. Uh, football, hockey, cricket, and uh, athletics. He has also served as a cricket umpire for the Tamil Nadu Cricket Association. See, uh, it's a, we, have call, we call a you know, holistic personality. Holistic personality. So uh, he has everything. And uh, Dr. Kalam was president of the Guerre Hall Students Union in Delhi, in Delhi University. He has studied in Delhi University. And while he was a student, he was the student union president also. He has participated in the TV rounds of the BBC Mastermind quiz. 
Dr. Kalam has won the UNESCO Photography Prize for Asia and the Pacific, Pacific that shows he has a good ability of photography, in photography also. So, friends, apart from this, yes, I would like to share my experience that he is very straightforward, very professional, and very uh, sincere academician, sincere personality that we have with us today. In fact, the Department of Sociology and the Center for the Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy is a great beneficiary to have you, to have him here among us. So, without uh, any hesitation, you please interact prof uh, with Professor Kalam and uh, ask your queries. Uh, I hope the session and the sessions going to come will benefit you all in all respects with regard in pursuing your academic careers as well as your research. So, I thank I thank the uh, university for giving me giving us this opportunity to invite him, facilitating us uh, to invite him in this uh, mission and I, on behalf of the Center for the Study of Social Exclusion and on behalf of the Department of Sociology, I thank Professor Kalam for accepting our invitation to be here despite of all his hectic activity. You know, I, I have read, uh, I've shared with you how busy he will be and how, um, uh, you know, uh, academic he is. But despite of all these things, you made it, sir. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. I request you to uh, start your presentation. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning to you all. And uh, thank you, Professor Mohammed, uh, first for having me here today, this morning. And also for giving those good words. I don't know how much of it's true, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for that. And uh, we're sorry that we're starting late, but I do have. Uh, the feeling that you people have some time and we can go ahead for some more time and uh, go ahead with the presentation. Uh, though we are starting late, uh, uh, I think uh, we should be able to go ahead with some of the things that I have got with me to make a presentation this morning here. So it's nice to see that uh, uh, in a warm day in Hyderabad, people are still here. But here today is something actually which is going to benefit not just the research scholars, also probably the faculty because the review of literature is something which you indulge in or which you require for so many different things which happen. And uh, can I move to this side slightly? Yeah. Uh, review of literature is important for uh, writing a dissertation, of course, whether, it's, uh, whether the dissertation... Do you have a color mic or something? No. No, but if the color mic is there, will this catch? No. Sorry? You can't, is it? No, but this is the recording, I think, for that purpose. Okay, fine. Yeah, as I was saying, the review of literature is important not just for people who are writing a dissertation or a thesis, even for other purposes. And other purposes is something where faculty will be involved. For instance, if you want to write a research proposal to get a grant, and many faculty, I am sure, are uh, already experienced in doing this kind of an exercise, and for them also it's important that you need to know how to do a review of literature. As I was saying, it's important not just for writing a dissertation, but also for people who have to do a review of literature for asking for a grant or something. Now, review of literature could vary depending on the discipline. Uh, So the, the, the discipline, for instance, here I'm trying to concentrate mostly on social sciences because uh, people in natural sciences or physical sciences also do that, but they do it in a slightly different way. Therefore, what we have got here is that suppose you are doing political science, you are doing sociology, or you are doing anthropology or economics, depending on the this, this review of literature could vary slightly. Uh, it could vary or differ in the sense that you may have to emphasize on the kind of discipline you come from, and you may have to write it slightly differently. But the overall picture in terms of what is there in every literature, that remains constant. Therefore, it could vary depending on the discipline. But it's normal to have a review of literature as a chapter in a dissertation, even an MA one. If you are doing an MA dissertation, I don't know how many of you do an MA dissertation. Sociology students probably do an MA dissertation. So it's, it's good that you have a review of literature. 
And uh, besides the MA1, you also do it for your doctoral dissertation. And now that MPhil has become defunct, I think, most of the universities do not have an MPhil degree anyway. So that doesn't matter. But then for PhD is required. And as I said, if you're writing a good re research proposal, you have to convince the people to give you some money and you will have to convince them for so many different things also. But then it's required that you have a proper kind of a thing where you do a review of literature in order to show the people that your scholarship is familiar with what you are going to work on. And that's what happens even in MA and a PhD dissertation. So next one, please. Yeah, a review of literature for critical appraisal of published body of knowledge. And by published body of knowledge is you already have books written on it, you may have dissertations written on it, or there might be certain articles which are written on it. Therefore, you have to go through that for two reasons. One is for classification, and the other one is for comparison of earlier research. By classification, uh, okay, uh, let me make a kind of general announcement. If anybody has any difficulty in understanding or following something, please raise your hand. I will come back and then we can stop and discuss. I don't have any problem with that. I'm a highly questionable character. Therefore, anybody who has any questions can ask me anytime. Okay. Uh, you do it uh, on the basis of a critical appraisal is done of the published work which is already available for two reasons. One is for classification. The other one is for comparison. And by classification is when do you classify? You classify when things are similar. Say for instance, uh, you have in zoology the phyla or the phylum which is there and there similar looking animals or similar looking organisms are put together and you call that as a class and here for instance uh, at the u at the university if you are talking about a class you are talking about people who have got a common interest they are doing either all ma or doing their ba or something they come together so classification happens when you have something similar and therefore, when you are doing a critical appraisal of the body of knowledge which is already published, you are trying to do two things. That the first thing is that you classify and put them together in order to show that there is some commonality here. The other one you do is to compare. Whereby, say for instance, I have already published something on X aspect and somebody else has done X on X aspect but in a different way. Therefore, the person may not agree with me or the researcher or the author may not agree with me. So what you do in that case is to compare and see how these two are different or these three are different or it could be these five are different. So depending on the availability of published material, you try to do these two things that's classify on the one hand and compare on the other hand in order to get a proper kind of a picture in terms of what is the similarity between what you are trying to do and others have done on the one hand and what's the difference between what you're trying to do and what others have done and the differences between themselves and the differences or similarities between themselves in terms of the published work. Now, this is done for both empirical and theoretical work. I am sure I don't have to go into the details of empirical and theoretical. I assume that you know. Uh, otherwise, uh, we may need about one full day if I have to explain everything. And uh, given the fact that there are constraints of time, so I will just say that it's required both for empirical and theoretical work that you do a review of literature. Next one, please. Now, you can divide the whole concept of what you are doing in terms of review of literature into three different kinds of parts. The first part is that you have an introduction to the review of literature itself. And in introduction, you try to define and identify the general topic, issue, or area of concern. Suppose you are working on poverty or you are working on housing, okay, you try to define what is, what is your working definition or what do you mean by housing or what do you mean by poverty and then on the basis of that general topic which is there or the issue or area of concern that you have, you try to look for literature which is already published and which is available in different forms, a dissertation. Uh, a research article or a book or whatever, even reviews can be taken as I will talk to you later. So that's the first thing that you do in introduction when you are talking about review of literature. The second one is to provide appropriate context for reviewing the literature. What is the context or the framework that you have wherein you are trying to review the literature? So that has to be set in in the introduction so that you know what you are trying to do. Next one. 
Now point out the overall trends in published work about the topic. Now if you take up any research, there are phases when certain things happen in research and those become trends during those periods. So the trend of uh, doing research on poverty for instance has changed. Uh, I'm using a general example so people from other disciplines don't get uh, offended. So uh, if, if you're talking about poverty for instance, earlier poverty was measured only in terms of income. Then they found out that consumption is also important in the study of poverty. Now the trend was from income to consumption and within consumption to come down and narrow down to something else whereby you see the nutritional value of what they are consuming. Therefore the trends can be different in a kind of the work that you are doing or even in published work. So if you go back and see for instance in economics, women's work was never recognized, uh, uh, women's work was never recognized in economics. They thought that women are doing something and they're not contributing anything. Gradually, not just because of the women's movement or feminist movement, even otherwise, people became conscious of the fact that suppose you employ somebody to do the kind of work which a woman does in the house, cooking, taking care of children, cleaning, taking care of stupid husbands. If you do all these things together, then you find that you have to pay. And if you have to pay, you can compute the amount and find out what's happening. So in household economics, you can find out that the trend has changed from just looking at what is happening to how things have changed. And like I gave the example, poverty, for instance, the trend. So the trends have been different. Now women's work in the kitchen, in the house, taking care of children and maintaining the house has become a different kind of, a, has become a kind of a line of work by itself. And therefore, it's important that the trends are also recognized when you are doing a review of your literature. Now, you point out any conflicts in theory, methodology, evidence, and conclusions. For instance, every work will have some aspect in regard to, as regards to theory. It will have something as regards to met methodology, evidence, and conclusions. Say, for instance, uh, household economics, for instance, we are doing something on uh, the com computing the work done by women. You find out that the methodology which was followed earlier is different from what it is. And the theory also, what, what are the aspects that you are taking into consideration? But the point is that if methodology has been different, it's likely that the evidence would be different. Suppose you have not taken into consideration uh, household care of the women, then the evidence that you get would be different. On the other hand, if you have done that, the evidence is going to be different. And, and naturally, your conclusions will also be different on the basis of that. Therefore, these are certain things which are required while you are doing this. And remember, this is still in the introduction part. Next one, please. Now, you also point out gaps in research and scholarship. Now, any research for that matter, depending on the time or chronology, you will find that there could be a gap. Uh, gaps are there in everything. In most of the research, for instance, it's also, also it's possible to find out that a person has done something, but then depending on your orientation, depending on the focus that you have, there could be what you can perceive as a gap. Now those gaps are required. Uh, the, 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 in all kinds of research, and even in non-research kind of a thing, proceedings which happen in different kinds of fields, gaps would be there. For instance, one of the easiest things that you can take up is that you have a body of knowledge, you have a body of uh, things in the legal framework called Indian Penal Code. Okay, most of the likely crimes which people do have been listed. Now, after the coming over, or after the popularity of social media, certain things have happened like stalking or in terms of trolling. Now, when that has happened, the Indian Penal Code does not have a section for those kind of things. Now, that's a gap. Now, if you look at what was happening in the medical field, for instance, uh, medical legal cases, everything was, or some of the things were taken into consideration. But after some time, it was found that there were areas which were not covered. For instance, overexposure of x-rays was never considered when the x-rays were introduced. Now, if, if overexposure is there, then it does damage to the patient. Therefore, these are the kind of gaps which can be there. And any research that you are doing, gaps in research and scholarship could be there. Therefore, when you are doing it, you need to recognize that. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you give reasons for 
reviewing the literature why is it that you are reviewing the literature isko hata sakte hain kya is taraf thoda theek hai okay next one sorry this this one particularly right both ab sunai de raha hai meri awaaz theek se aa rahi hai acha theek hai uh okay next one yeah explain the criteria used in analyzing and comparing literature now you 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 analyze but you need to know what are the criteria that you are using for analyzing and also when you are comparing you need to know i mean you need to say why you are comparing the literature which is there and this is this depends on the kind of research that you are doing and what you have got as your own kind of a uh, orientation or what you have got as your own topic of research depending on you will have to say how you are analyzing and comparing the literature i also explain certain literature is or not included when you do a review you include certain things because they are relevant to your own research but then there are other things whereby you don't include them okay so the moment you use the word inclusion it also means automatically that there is other side of it called exclusion so you have to give reasons as to why you include on the one side and then why exclude on the other side so both both these things have to be done so that people know why you have adopted and why you have not adopted certain things next yeah this that's the first part was the introduction the second part is writing the body now when you write the body for the review of literature it should include the reviews which are the say for instance there is a book written published by sage on uh, something concerning uh, political issues like elections okay now that book may have been reviewed by two or three people or four people in the newspaper or in epw or something therefore it is also important that you not only look at the published work by itself but also the reviews of that work which will give an idea that the author has done something and in case there are three or four reviews let me tell you those will not be constant those will not be consistent each reviewer may have a different kind of a focus or may have a different kind of line of argument therefore when you look at reviews it gives you an idea that reviews are important so that you have a proper picture of what has already been published then the theoretical articles might be there concerning that particular thing then case studies now case studies are quite important because case studies are more focused on the theme of research that you are doing say for instance you want to find out what has happened to old people in a society gerontology research for instance you do a general kind of a work and you talk to people and get certain kind of ideas or certain kinds of things for them but if you meet a 80 year old person then you talk to the person and find out what changes have come about in his lifetime or if it's a woman in her lifetime you are doing a case study now case studies are important to focus on certain things therefore on a published work if there are any case studies you you focus on those case studies also and it will give you a lot of information as to what the case studies mean then there are common denominators like qualitative versus quantitative approaches i don't have to go into the details because when you're talking about qualitative you're talking about certain things where you have written kind of narratives which are there those are the qualitative ones and when you're talking about quantitative you have the statistical figures and the other things which are there and therefore there are common denominators and you have to use those things in your work when you are looking at the published work itself to do the review and next one yeah then the conclusions of the authors for instance you have a book on elections why karnataka was important in 2023 okay somebody can give the election scenario they can say that congress got 135 bjp lost janata dal did very badly and they were trying to be king makers and they became poppers now there could be different views of authors or people who have written on karnataka elections and the conclusions of those people may not be similar somebody may say that the minorities have voted in a big way and that was the reason why bjp lost and somebody can say that the 
rhetoric on religion and hindutva politics which uh, bjp was following was not amenable or were not palatable to the people and therefore the bjp lost that could be the second thing okay there could be different kinds of conclusions but the event may be the same event is election karnataka 2023 conclusions are different okay then specific purpose or objective the chronology etc suppose you are doing something in terms of child rearing the child rearing practices have changed over time earlier when there was no schooling at all child rearing meant only what happened as a process of socialization within the household itself and sometimes the society also was responsible for child rearing in smaller kind of communities today the kind of apartment that you live in nobody knows how many children you have or whether you have children whether you have a wife or not we have a children you have a wife you have a wife you don't have children nobody your neighbors don't know that and therefore the family family or extended family or the society itself indulging in or taking part in the socialization process is not happening today therefore the social so over a period of time when you look at the chronology of certain events you find that things have changed now when things have changed you you try to find out as to why it has happened and that's what is known as chronology a timeline which gives you and then in all studies you may not you may, you may not be able to get chronology but it's possible to look at how research in that particular field has changed over a period of time for instance uh, one of the abiding interests that i have uh, in terms of research besides the other research interests is what has happened to the family okay so if you go back in data and look at how how the the household censuses which are available and what has happened to the family uh, india's first census came out in 1871 and every decadal census says uh, every decade every decade there has been a census which are known as the decadal censuses till about 2011 and for some reason the smart people who are there in the present regime the bjp have not gone in for the 2021 election and the uh, kind of excuse which was given was that pandemic was there but then that's not the main reason for that there are other reasons probably and that's one of the things now till 1941 till 1931 there was a caste based census you could know that people belong to different castes were there after that caste based census was uh, stopped and only you have got religion based census from 1941 till now okay and there are reasons for that i won't go into that but the point i'm pointing out is if you go through the censuses you get data on what is happening to the family not just in india but if you have census from any other country from other countries also therefore the household size of the uh, people say for instance today people talk about the breakdown of the joint family and therefore people argue that at one point there were lots of people living together 8 and 12 people and now the pe- families have become nuclear where only husband wife and children are living it's possible that that's true only to some extent but this whole thing about joint living where 10 12 people were living together is bogus because in 19, in the 1870s the uh, the the, the uh, life span of the people the average life expectancy was only about 21 years people died on an average yeah it may be shocking to you but it's true go back and look at the data 21 22 was the average life uh, life expectancy in the 1870s or 1860s gradually it has come up india's independence 1947 uh, it was something like about 40 45 average life expectancy today is about 72 now if people die at 22 23 if they get married about 4 5 years later even if, even if they have children by the time they have children the grandparents are dead therefore this whole notion of families were large and uh, the average size of a household was 10 12 13 and all is not wrong because in 1871 the average size of the family was about 5 and today depending on whether an urban area or a rural area it's about the same it's about 4.5 or 4.6 so there has not been a drastic kind of change this has been an abiding interest for me to look at what has happened to the family over years now that's what i'm talking about as chronology 
when you look at it statistically, but then you need good data for that. You can't speculate. For instance, it comes as a shock to you that people died at 22, 23 life expectancy in 1870s. Okay, and this is not out of the box or out of the mind that I'm doing. Statistics is available from the census. Okay, next one. Now you summarize the individual studies or articles which are there with as little detail as, as, uh, as each merits according to as compared to importance in the literature. Remember in the space length denotes significance. Now what is meant in this statement is that if you do a review, some can go into four or five pages for a work and some may be over in about two, three paragraphs. Okay, the length which is there will tell you how important or how significant the studies have been. We are okay for time, no? Okay. Uh, not my own time, it's all everybody's time also. Okay, fine, thank you. So uh, the length of something that you have got will also show you whether that thing was important or significant from a point of view of what the, your research itself is going on. Next one, please. You provide the reader with strong detailed sentences at the beginnings of the paragraph. Now, say for instance, somebody is writing, then what you do is, you write something, you break the paragraph, go to another paragraph. There's no link between the earlier paragraph and the next one that you're doing. You need to recapitulate or bring in in some way some kind of an idea as to what is that you have discussed earlier, either in the chapter or in the paragraph, in order to have a proper kind of a flow which tells people that this is there. Now, the, 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 the strong indicators should be there throughout. And at every level, what you need to do is, say for instance, if somebody tells me that people died at 23 in 1871, I can ask a question, so what? Now, the so what is so important to me because it also shows me so many different things. How much people could have earned during their lifetime? how many children they could have produced, how strong this household can be if somebody dies at 23, and how many older relatives can be there when somebody is producing or, uh, or having, uh, procreating and having children. Therefore, at every stage that you are doing, if you are very conscious and if you take yourself very seriously, which most scholars don't, also the supervisors don't take themselves very seriously, so you keep asking the question, so what? So if you ask the question, so what? it gives you answers in terms of why you are doing it. Therefore, so what summary sentences at intermediate points in the review to aid in understanding comparisons and analysis. Therefore, if you do that, your flow would be good, your write-up would be good, and people will think that it's a good work which has been done. And next. Now, yeah, this is the third part, which you can say writing the conclusion for the body that you have got with you. Now here you have to summarize the major contributions of significant studies. Suppose you have done a review of literature of about uh, 15 or 20 or 30 studies. Okay, now you try to summarize as to what each one was and the articles of the book. And, and maintaining the focus established in the introduction. In the introduction you have done certain things in terms of what you are going to do. Now that focus should be there till the end whereby you try to show that you started off with something and this is going to be there and the focus will be there and then you can bring it bring bring the thing consistently up to the uh, uh, level of the conclusion itself as to what you started with it basically means that have a proper consistent way of doing doing your work next one now state of the art is something which is important in all subjects or all disciplines One example I can give you for state of the art, for instance, from a common discipline uh, without any bias against you people, is look at astronomy. If you look at astronomy, 400 years back, people used the word sunrise and sunset. They are still using it. To the best of my knowledge, sun has never risen and sun has never set. Sun is set in one state place it has never moved from there it's the earth which is going around therefore 400 years back people thought that it was the sun which was going around the earth 
and that was the body of knowledge or that was the amount of knowledge people had at that time and therefore they made statement like sunrise and sunset okay today it's not valid because you know what's happening so the state of the art in astronomy today is that you you can take a spaceship go to moon because that's the closest satellite which is there to the earth and the second one which is closest to the earth is mars and they're doing it and you can have so many different things in terms of current research which is happening in astronomy so that is the state of the art and i am sure if people knew what is there on the moon about 200 years back they would have never compared the beloved with the moon the kind of craters which are there on the moon today it will be very difficult to say that मेरी बीवी और मे बी गर्ल फ्रेंड जो है चांद की तरह है चांद में क्या है आज कल नो दैट्स अगेन इट शोज यू द स्टेट ऑफ आर्ट इन टर्म्स ऑफ योर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द सैटेलाइट ऑफ द अर्थ मून वेयर बाय यू नो दैट मून इज फुल ऑफ क्रेटर्स सो द वर्ड हनी मून इट्स मे अंडर गो ए चेंज इफ यू अप्लाई इट बट देन वॉट हैपन्स इज वंस यू लर्न सर्टन थिंग्स यू डू नॉट गिव दैट अवे इन पोएट्री एंड लिटरेचर एंड ऑल द वर्ड मून हैज़ यू बीन यूज इन सच अ वे that today the word is not valid if you are trying to do it through. so state of the art in any discipline shows that things have evolved and during evolution of that kind of a thing you find that things have changed therefore state of the art for the body of knowledge review pointing out major methodological and many studies may have a flaw or a gap or uh, may have uh, a mistake uh, in meth- methodology or gaps in research itself and inconsistencies in theory and findings so this what you do uh, and then you go ahead and try to relate it as issue pertinent to future study so the future study is something which you are going to do so you you have to point out how things have evolved what is the state of the art today and how you are going to relate certain things in terms of the gaps which were there or the methodological flaws which were there to the future study which is going on next now you conclude by providing some insight into the relationship between the central topic of the literature review and a larger area of study such as a discipline a scientific endeavor or a profession now this is something the insight will show you that what you have done as a literature review you are trying to relate it to your larger area and then this it has to be in a scientific way and uh, something which aids your profession so Uh, this is something which you need to do on the basis of what all you have got from one introduction to body and then the conclusion and this is this is something where you are coming to the end of it whereby you try to show that uh, insights have to be provided if you don't provide an insight then what is it that you have done in terms of trying to find out the review of literature or doing the review of literature next one now if you have to recapitulate which means that if we have to summarize and see what all we have done so far i have been very fast in order not to hold you people but as i said i am open to any kind of questions or something if you have any questions on what you have so far discussed let's do it now then i will summarize the things so that things will become more clear yeah any questions any clarifications or any doubts with some people people may have unpublished work aapko milega kahan se आपको मिलता जो वर्क मिलता है वो पब्लिश वर्क ही है ना अनपब्लिश वर्क का मतलब होता है ये शायद डिसर्टेशन होगी हाँ तो पहले जब हम शुरू किए तो उस पर उस वक्त पर भी बता रहा था कि डिसर्टेशन वगैरह जो भी है यू इंक्लूड एवरी थिंग डिसर्टेशन आर इम्पॉर्टेंट इफ़ यू हैव एक्सेस टू दैट सो से फॉर इंस्टेंस मोस्ट ऑफ द लाइब्रेरीज हैव गॉट डिसर्टेशन विच आर देयर एम ए डिसर्टेशन पी एच डी डिसर्टेशन सम ऑफ द पीपल मै हैव डन ए हायर रिसर्च ऑल्सो और समटाइम्स यू हैव प्रोजेक्ट रिपोर्ट्स विच आर नॉट पब्लिश एनी थिंग विच यू कैन एक्सेस ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ योर रिसर्च दैट्स इम्पॉर्टेंट नॉट जस्ट गोइंग थ्रू एनी थिंग विच इज देर वॉट एवर इज रेलिवेंट टू द वर्क दैट यू आर डूइंग ऑन दैट येस बट यू हैव टू गिव योर प्रॉपर कैंड ऑफ ए रेफरेंस टू दैट ओके हाँ तो ऑनलाइन सोर्सेज समथिंग आई विल टॉक अबाउट दैट लेटर इफ यू हैव टाइम बट देन ऑनलाइन सोर्सेज हैव बिकम ए हेड एक फॉर एवरीबडी या बट ऑफकोर्स द पॉइंट इज दैट एनी थिंग विच यू कैन एक्सेस अनपब्लिश वर्क लाइक थीसीज 
project reports, okay, and maybe some other body of knowledge where somebody travel log, for instance. Earlier, uh, people used to have what are known as travel logs. People wrote on the basis of the travels that they were making. Those may not have got published. But if you have access to that, it will show you that the travel log could be important because the travel log will give you idea about what kind of society existed at a particular point in time. Therefore, travel logs, if published or unpublished, those are also important. Okay, so nothing which can be relevant to your topic should be neglected. That's the big point. Look, if you have a lack of time, you can't do research. That's the first point. Okay, so if you start research and say that you don't have time, then you don't have any purpose to research. So, what do you do? Huh? Then you have to, if you have a dissertation, और आप कहते हैं कि वक्त की वक्त की कमी है तो ऐसी टॉपिक चूज कीजिए आप जो उस वक्त पे कर सके ठीक है इफ यू हैव अ बेड शीट द बेड शीट्स लेंथ विल नॉट इंक्रीज यू विल हैव टू फोल्ड योरसेल्फ इन सच अ वे दैट यू अकोमोडेट योरसेल्फ विद इन द बेड शीट देयरफॉर इफ यू से दैट यू डोंट हैव टाइम डिपेंड्स ऑन द काइंड ऑफ टॉपिक दैट यू हैव चोजन एंड इट विल बी योर रिस्पांसिबिलिटी एज़ वेल एज़ द पर्सन हु इज गाइडिंग यू और हु सुपरवाइजिंग योर रिसर्च टू डू दैट The person should not give you something so big that you can't chew. You may bite it, but you may not chew it. Therefore, you have to confine yourself to that's the first thing which you do in research. Look at your ability, look at the time factor, and look at how much you can chew or how much you can bite, and that's important. Uh, time factor, uh, AMA dissertation should be done depending on the kind of time which is available to you and how much you can work within that time. and. The frame which is uh, of research which you choose should be uh, in consonance with the time available to you and the resources which are available to you. Sir, uh, मोस्ट रेलेवेंट जो हैं उनको देखना चाहिए आपको इसीलिए मैं बता रहा था कि थोड़ी चीज़ों को आप इंक्लूड करेंगे और इंक्लूजन का मतलब है कि थोड़ी चीज़ आप एक्सक्लूड भी करेंगे सो यू शुड यू शुड नो द क्राइटेरिया और द रीजंस फॉर इंक्लूडिंग सम थिंग्स एंड नॉट इंक्लूडिंग सम थिंग्स और हर पब्लिश बॉडी जो होती है may not be relevant the topic may be may look similar but when you start reading properly and carefully you will find out that okay some of this is not relevant and this liye jo bata raha tha na the review that you write the length shows the significance of what you are doing theek hai to us bina pe aapko ye karna chahiye ki ab jab padhte hain koi published work और उसको आप अपने अपने रिसर्च के साथ रिलेट करना चाहते हैं तो आपको ध्यान में ये रखना चाहिए कितना रेलेवेंट है आपके रिसर्च के लिए और उसमें से आप कितनी चीज़ें निकाल सकते हैं हम बहुत सारे होते हैं अब इंटरनेट जाने पे एक टॉपिक पे जो है दस हज़ार मिल जाएंगे आपको बट देन दैट्स नॉट रिसर्च ओके सो दैट्स वॉट इज़ अ प्रॉब्लम बेसिकली ईजी अवेलेबिलिटी ऑफ दैट एंड लेट टू Quite a few different kinds of things which has happened, and uh, I will come to that if we still have a few minutes after I finish this. Uh, there I will talk about it. If you know your topic properly, and if your research is going on in the proper kind of a line, when you read something, you can make out whether it is relevant to you or not, and whether the researcher has done it properly or not, depending on the methodology adopted. Okay, and from the methodology, what kind of evidence comes out? and from those that kind of an evidence what kind of conclusions are made uh, a conscientious and uh, very uh, hard working or uh, smart researcher should be able to uh, find out as to if there is a flaw in the study or not and many times there could be and sometimes it may not be so nowadays you have got everything smart you have smart computer smart tv smart watches the problem is people th that's the question Which you can have. Everything else around you is smart. Okay, yeah. You have to search and find out. Say, for instance, 
somebody has worked on uh, uh, areas of famine okay so earlier today today you are talking about something in terms of first thing people do is to google and find out what is available but even before google and internet was available people did review of literature okay the review kaise literature kaise find karna depends on how smart you are theek hai so today you can do it on the internet but people earlier did it without internet you have you should think how they should have done it okay you find out what is the, you go to the library find out on that particular subject and sometimes the library books are classified in terms of i'm using the word classification here similarities which are there so similar studies sometimes are stacked together that's what people did earlier that's what i did before the internet came in okay now things have become so easy google has something in common with arnab goswami uh, do you know who is arnab goswami so what is the commonality between arnab goswami and google they don't allow you to finish a sentence both of them okay before you finish a sentence then this okay so google may can say today it's easy but earlier people did it in libraries okay they did it in libraries on the basis of published work as well as they went to certain other libraries in other universities to find out if there are any dissertations on those topics and they did it physically by traveling probably they were smart anyway today you have got the google with you and most of it is available published work okay but then people may also prefer unpublished work because plagiarism is very easy if unpublished work is there because uh, the people who are monitoring will not be able to find out that you have plagiarized because if you are doing it from something which is unpublished published work within seconds you can make out that it has been plagiarized but in the case of unpublished dissertation or report or some kind of a travel log thing which is there lying in a corner of a library you will not know therefore sometimes it doesn't show but then uh, uh one of the central universities in the same city for instance one phd thesis which came to me uh one third of the phd thesis was taken straight away from different journals in the two thirds which was there half of the two third was again plagiarized not from journals but from books okay now the problem here is the candidate is of course dishonest but i will also take up a problem with the supervisor if i am supervising somebody's research for 3 4 5 years if i do not know the capability of writing of that particular person the fault lies with me as supervisor if i know you for 2 years if i know you for 2 months if you write something for me i will know your capability now that's the problem which comes up when easy availability on the net of things people have the tendency to just cut and paste and this is a phd thesis that i am talking about and i had to photocopy the journals from where the thesis was copied and sent it to the vice chancellor and the vice chancellor was stupid instead of taking action on that he did something else anyway that's besides the point but the point is that a smart person should know how to do it okay uh, not just on the net go to the library go to a particular section suppose you are looking at flood or famine sometimes the books are bunched on that okay and sometimes if there any dissertation you will have to physically go through and find out but now because of the inflip net and other things things have become easier and they are stacking all the phd theses from different universities which will be made available from which is all show the research or something show show something they call it show ganga show dar show the ganga okay oh yeah so most of it is available but what do you do with that is more important than the availability of that okay yeah any more questions ha yeah. uh-huh. sir i would like to say one concept before belong to my students in the beginning beginning of when you when you have when you are very clear about your topic okay but the problem with uh, 
the, the choice of the topic is that 99% of the students don't choose a topic. And many times somebody has registered for a PhD, I ask the person if I know or if I come across like this kind of gatherings and what's your topic. Oh, I'm, I'm waiting for the supervisor to give me the topic. Half of your research is undone there itself. If you're not capable of choosing a topic, you are completely incapable of doing your PhD. And the supervisor should also be that. For instance, one of the top students who is heading a department in a central university today, a girl, was my student. And before she, she, was, she was net qualified, of course, because I have never looked at anybody who was not qualified. I'm sorry, but then that was the first criteria of somebody who wanted to work with me. This girl had to write the proposal four times, proposal of about four pages, four times in order to get registered. And she's doing fantastically well today, heading a department at a central university, and people want her. But uh, if I have to be immodest, uh, the last time I met her, she said uh, somebody met me, and then he, she, that person asked me, where did you work? And then I said, University of Madras. And then she said, who did you work with? Then I t told your name. Then she said, I don't have to ask you any questions. So this was something which has happened to her. I'm boasting a bit, but then it was her capability to do that because she wrote the proposal four times. And the topic was chosen by her. And she did field work in very, very difficult kind of condition, uh, conditions in a hill tribe in Andhra Pradesh where every time she came back home for some time uh, or came to the university from the field, half of her things were gone, either stolen or missing or something. But she went back and did her field work there for nearly 18 months in those kind of conditions. Okay, now this is an anthropological field research where anthropologists go stupidly, stay with the community, do all kinds of stupid things and write a dissertation, which also turns out to be a stupid kind of a thing under stupid supervisors. But she did that and she's doing very, very well today. And I'm not boasting, but what I'm trying to say, the point that I'm trying to convey across to you is that if you are not capable of choosing a research topic, don't do research. Okay you are at least honest enough to raise the question, but there is no easy answer for that. It's practice, okay? Our Parthay Vakht Pe Jo Hai Na, 90% of the students that I have seen, if they don't find the meaning for a particular sentence, they just leave that and go to the other. That's why you don't understand. You don't understand because you don't use a dictionary. Even at this age, I don't write, or read anything without having a dictionary with me. Okay, So the reason why you don't understand certain things is because there are words in a sentence. You follow certain words. Certain words you don't follow. And the words that you don't follow, you need to know the meaning in order to follow the whole sentence, at which people don't do. They just skip that sentence and go. That's the reason why they don't understand. Saat mein ek dictionary rakho. Yeah, who is your supervisor? Who is your dictionary? Or in the department? Mein, this is one thing I did. I kept two things. One was a dictionary where the research students were. For typists, the research scholars or colleagues, tak, there was a dictionary when I was heading and I was the dean of the in Madras University. Dictionary should be. One other thing is how many of you know, please be honest, you sit down. How many of you know a combinatory dictionary? Has anybody seen or known about a combinatory dictionary? Don't bother. 90% of the deans and the vice chancellors I know have never known about a combinatory dictionary and they have never seen a combinatory dictionary. Combinatory dictionary is something where if you take a word, it tells you how to combine that word in a sentence. Okay. And 90%, uh, I said, Vice Chancellors where I have interacted on the Board of Studies and the Boards and uh, Planning and Management, nobody has seen this, but it's available in the market. It is known as Combinatory Dictionary of English, published by different publishers. Okay, one of the better known and cheaper for you would be by Kriya Publishers from Chennai, C-R-E-A, C-R-E-A. C-R-E-A, Kriya Publisher from Chennai. This is a cheaper American edition. The American edition maybe is about 2,000 rupees. This will be about 400 rupees or something. And if you buy on Amazon, what they do? 
they give you a further concession. Okay? They know that all the research scholars in the country are poor and the faculty also. Therefore, they give you a discount on that. Yes. Therefore, keep these two things with you. Things will become easier. The first one, what is the word length? There is no such thing as word length. And that's what I was emphasizing. The word length or the length of what you are doing would depend on the importance and significance of the work that you are reviewing. If the work is very significant, very important to you and it relates to your work, then it may go into four pages, five pages, three pages, or it could be one paragraph and some of the things you may just leave it. Okay. Now, if somebody has done a superficial work, okay, you don't have to waste your time by commenting on that. You say that there is no methodology, there is no evidence, there is no conclusion, it was a superficial work. Number one, how did it get published? Such works don't get published, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, and if it is so superficial and uh, uh, not up to the mark, uh, why do you waste your time on reviewing that? You can just say in one sentence or one paragraph that this work is on the topic related to me or my research, but it has got flaws. That's what I was saying, flaws, gaps, all these things which are there. Yeah, you can just say that, that's it. We'll continue. Thank you. Time constraints. Next one, you were 20 minutes. I will try. Yeah. Now we are on 12.06. Okay, we'll finish at 12.30. 12.30 or 12.45. 35. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to recapitulate, I will go very fast. If somebody has any problem, raise your hand. I will not look at you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. To recapitulate, that's to summarize. A literature review is a selective, integrated analysis and synthesis of what has been researched and published on a particular topic. Okay. Next. Literature review is a process typically starting from selecting a topic to review and concluding with writing a manuscript to report the published work on the topic. Now, some of the questions that you raised, the answers are here if you are following this. If you are busy talking to your neighbor and criticizing the thing that I am doing, of course you will not be able to follow what I am saying. But I am just summarizing what I have already said. Okay. Now, next. A literature review is an iterative process, that is, you emphasize on something. You may have to keep coming back to previous stages to refine your topic. Now, on the basis of a review of literature, you may have to refine the topic of research that you are continuing. It's possible. And it happens quite often. There's nothing wrong in that. When you start off with a topic, there may be reason to do that. Or modify the search statements and or revise the working thesis, etc. So on the basis of work which is already available, so many different things can happen. So you can revise your own work, you can change the topic of research which is there or modify the topic of your research and the whole thesis can also get a revision on the basis of proper understanding of the published work which is there. Yeah. A good literature review is not, now we are talking about is not, earlier three we talked about is, is not a mere summary of what you have read on a topic. It's not just a summary. You have to do one, two, three, the steps that we did earlier. A good literature review is not a summary of everything that's reported on a topic. Say, for instance, you're talking about famine or flood or something. Whatever is reported on that, you say that A, B, C, D, this is there, this is there. That will be a laundry list. That, that will not be a proper kind of a review which you are doing. So laundry lists are not required here. It may be the required element. Yes, next. A good literature review is not an annotated bibliography. Does anybody know what is an annotated bibliography? Anyway, a bibliography where you explain the main points which are there in a particular work. I mean, uh, if, if you take up one published work, give the, uh, give the bibliography and in that you give a small kind of a write-up as to what that thing contains. So, review of literature is not annotated bibliography. Next. But it is a critical summary of relevant and selective literature on the topic. That's what you do. It's a critical summary of relevant and selective literature on the topic. 
आप इस पर ध्यान दीजिए इस पर यही होता है उसमें बट इट डज सिचुएट एंड फोकस योर रिसर्च इन कॉन्टेक्सट सो योर रिसर्च इन कॉन्टेक्सट इट कैन बी ब्रॉट अप इन अ प्रॉपर काइंड ऑफ ए कॉन्टेक्सट इफ यू डू ए प्रॉपर काइंड ऑफ ए रिव्यू सो दिस इज वॉट यू डू इट इज अ क्रिटिकल समरी ऑफ दिस नेक्स्ट बट इट डज यूज क्रेडिबल एंड मोस्ट रेलिवेंट सोर्सेस नाउ सम ऑफ द क्वेश्चन विच वर रेज यू शुड लुक एट इट इट यूज क्रेडिबल दैट इज very well done works credible works and relevant sources which are there to your own research but it's written in clear language okay now most of the things that i am talking about anybody who is smart and i believe all of you are when it comes to the computer and internet you will find it on the net only thing is i have put them together to make your life difficult or easy okay next it's a piece of research on its own a literature review can be a piece of research on its own so that's why it goes as separate kind of a chapter in a thesis or in a proposal which is there but it does add value to the existing knowledge on the topic okay the topic is there you are trying to add value to the existing kind of topic which is there next yeah now this is something which is very crucial you have done something in terms of review literature but then i will read out very fast this is a definition taken from already existing thing the definition for plagiarism and this is something very important nobody can do without doing this the use of others published and unpublished ideas or words or other intellectual property without attribution or permission and presenting them as new and original rather than derived from an existing source that amounts to plagiarism okay next plagiarism occurs when a writer deliberately uses these are not my words as i said i have taken from them plagiarism occurs when a writer deliberately uses someone else's language ideas or other other original not common knowledge material without acknowledging his source that's plagiarism next about definitions applied to texts published in print or online to manuscripts and to the work of others now this is something some some sometimes sometimes the published work sometimes it's not there sometimes it's available online some of these are manuscripts which are there in the library or something okay of other works now plagiarism also means including self plagiarism for instance if i have published something earlier or i have written something earlier i take out one or two pages from that and incorporate in the new thing that i am doing without telling the others that this is my work even if it is my work and i am incorporating it here that is known as self plagiarism okay then mosaic what is a mosaic you know the floor at least mosaic okay it has got different kinds of ingredients kind of a thing okay and therefore it's known as a mosaic so mosaic plagiarism is also one sort of plagiarism whereby you borrow phrases from a source without using quotation marks or finding synonyms for the author's language say for instance the author has used definition then you can say that it denotes you change the word but then you have not changed the entire th- thing so you are modifying the author's language but you are still using it say for instance if you go to the uh, uh, if if you are writing a word file take any word and then right click on it it shows you synonyms and thesaurus and different kinds of things so you may take somebody's sentence and go to the synonyms and change certain words but it still amounts to plagiarism finding synonyms while keeping to the same general language structure and meaning as found in the original if you do that it's still plagiarism okay next plagiarism basically of two types one is use of ideas thought even thought use of ideas thought or inventions and present it as his or own without acknowledgement okay that's one kind of plagiarism the other one is plagiarism of text word by word you pick up like you do in the phd thesis which is quite common take up pick up the things put them together the supervisor knows or does not know but doesn't matter you try to cite it and the examiner will be blamed if the thesis is awarded because in one of the thesis i had to say say that and it was again from a central university from delhi i had to the first sentence i wrote was if i pass this thesis mm-hmm. then the blame will come to the examiner and i am not worried about the supervisor and the candidate if it's kept in the library anybody looking at the plagiarized work would know that the examiner has passed it which means the examiner was stupid 
So that was the first sentence I put in. So word for word, for word and next. Yeah, copying a portion of text from another source without giving credit to its author and without enclosing the borrowed text in quotation marks and copying a portion of text from one or more sources. That's again plagiarism. Yeah. Inserting and or deleting some of the words. Say for instance, there's a sentence. You put in two, three words in that and think you are smart. Of course you are. And then you delete some words, okay? Thinking that nobody will make out. That still amounts to plagiarism. Then substituting some words with synonyms. That's exactly the thing we do. But not giving credit to the author. Not enclosing the verbatim material in quotation marks. If the word is taken verbatim, word for word, you give the quotation mark, give the author's name, give the date of publication or year of year of publication and that's the way it should go and also page number that's what is known as proper referencing next ethical writers make every effort to acknowledge sources fully and appropriately in accordance with the context and genres of writing okay now this is what ethical writing is about now ethical writing is important uh, in anything, whether you are writing an article or we are writing a thesis or you are writing a research report, it's important. Next, over, fine, happy? Yes, of course, everybody is happy. Now that's over. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. We, I hope we enjoyed today's uh, presentation on review of literature uh, of social sciences. Now I request uh, Dr. Ziauddin, Associate Professor, for a vote of thanks. This is indeed a pleasure for somebody like me uh, to hear and listen one of the most renowned scholar of uh, social sciences, and we all of all of us should feel privileged. Or ye khas taur se isliye ke Department of Sociology ke students ki zindagi ka ye bahut aham hissa hai. कि हम डिजर्टेशंस लिख रहे हैं और कई लोग सिनॉप्सिस के बाद के जो मरहले होते हैं उस पे काम कर रहे हैं तो डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशियोलॉजी और सेंटर फॉर द स्टडी ऑफ सोशल एक्सक्लूजन एंड इंक्लूसिव पॉलिसी की तरफ से हम सभी लोग प्रोफेसर एम ए कलाम साहब का शुक्र शुक्रिया अदा करते हैं ख़ास तौर से इसलिए कि आपने इस तपिश में इस गर्मी में इस हॉल में एक लंबा वक्त स्टूडेंट के साथ गुजारा और बहुत ही मालूमती चीज़ों से आप उन लोगों को वाकिफ़ कराए इनफैक्ट पिछले ही हफ्ते हम रिव्यू ऑफ लिटरेचर के बारे में बात कर रहे थे क्लासेस में डिस्कस कर रहे थे आई एम श्योर ऑल ऑफ यू मस्ट हैव इन्जॉयड एंड डेफिनेटली दिस इज़ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट नेग्लिजेंट एरिया विच मोस्ट ऑफ द स्टूडेंट डू इट बिकॉज दे डोंट नो हाउ टू रेफर हाउ टू स्टडी हाउ टू साइट दे वर्क एंड वी हार्डली understand what is plagiarism and similarity and then most of the time your chapters are hanged up ye mujhe ummeed hai ki aap tamam logon ne iska fayda uthana hai aur aap uthayenge future mein inshallah sir bahut shukriya ki aapne ye bahut hi aham mauzu pe aapne ye khutba diya khaas taur se mere tamam sathi yahan par jo maujood hain dr mohsina hum sab kafi saal sath mein the ab alag alag shobe mein hain dr kareem डॉक्टर हिलाल डॉक्टर एहतिशाम अख्तर और आप तमाम पीएचडी के स्टूडेंट्स मैं ख़ास तौर से इंस्ट्रक्शन मीडिया सेंटर के तमाम दोस्तों का भी शुक्रिया अदा करता हूं क्योंकि आपने इस रिकॉर्ड इस प्रोग्राम को रिकॉर्ड करके अब बहुत ही नायाब बना दिया है आ, ऐसे तमाम लेक्चर्स ख़ास तौर से उर्दू यूनिवर्सिटी की तरफ जानब से जब जाती हैं तो ये अच्छा पैगाम भी देता है कि हमारे यहाँ बहुत ही उमदा और सिग्निफिकेंट टॉक्स भी होते हैं और हम क्लास में लाइव कर रहे हैं ये बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है और इस इसलिए हमारे लिए बहुत इम्पॉर्टेंट है मैं यूनिवर्सिटी के तमाम अहदेदारान ख़ास तौर से वाइस चांसलर साहब का रजिस्ट्रार साहब का और और एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन का शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ कि उन्होंने प्रोग्राम को अरेंज करने के लिए कंडक्ट करने के लिए ये मंजूरी दी स्कूल ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस में यक दिगरे कई सारे इवेंट हो रहे हैं वरना सर उमूमा ये रूम में जगह नहीं मिलती है स्टूडेंट्स जब रहते हैं अगले हफ्ते से सेमेस्टर एग्जामिनेशन से ये भी दूसरी वजह है वरना पीएचडी स्टूडेंट से ही हमारा एक हॉल भर जाता है ये तमाम लोग ख़ासतौर से सोशियोलॉजी से हैं कुछ दूसरे सूबे से हैं तो आप तमाम का बेहद शुक्रिया और फिर से आखिर में आपका शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ कि आपने लिख दीजिए बेहद शुक्रिया